two, two one. one. Hey guys, welcome hey back. Hey guys, to- welcome. You want to fight? Need to fight? We're, We're back. back. We're, We're back. back. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Drunken Chip Podcast. This is episode 65, and we're doing things a little bit differently today. So we have a special guest coming in, Jonathan Barrio from the Charlotte Gamers Network. Um, he's the co-founder and the executive director, and we have a really good chat with him um, just about CGN and all of the things that CGN does. And we just finished recording, and that was a pretty solid episode. Fantastic I, say, I really episode. liked it. Yeah. Um, Fucking interesting dude. Uh, I was I went to one of their events not too long ago. Theme song. Yeah, just put it right in the middle of your sentence. I really wanted to cut you off again. Yeah. No, you don't. Get, you get one. Yeah. You get one, and then, then never again. You get. You're like no. no. Just take so a bat fun. and just I clear off this table. Part. You're like no. He vanishes. Just that mean? <laughs> fade out, yeah, fade Brian, out. dude. That would have been. We should have made Brian cook up some voodoo and cook, like to cut me out of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> he just fades up. <laughs> That's my royal rule. I get to live forever, but I have to say theme song like, every time we do some shit. That's the best way to beat him. You gotta cut it. Yeah. Oh my god, that would have fucking killed me. I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> 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 Take those theme song. I don't go. Ah. <laughs> and then it starts, and then I'm never back in the frame. <laughs> back in the like, He's gone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you sealed me. Did I be a good prank video? Dude, you have to you have to take like a like a three weeks off the podcast after that happens. Dude, <laughs> Just, uh, we all right. So next time like, I gotta go, drink. <laughs> if I ever have to like leave town or something, we record that. And then I'm just ne- I'm not I'm gone for like two <laughs> weeks and then it's <laughs> that's hilarious. And then you guys do like a summoning circle and then I just come back <laughs> and like we should do it like nonchalant like nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> like I was continue. never here. Like there's like <laughs> like next week's is like nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the week you did you wasn't here and I was like I, yeah I finally absorbed on that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we just moved on. <laughs> Yo, tell you, I gotta say the fucking. Not too long ago, we did the hot sauce episode and you posted it on Twitter. What? Because <laughs> immediately after the hot sauce episode, we went on hiatus for two weeks. Yeah. And you posted, if you're wondering where the podcast at, <laughs> the sauce actually killed Jordan and Brian. Who tweeted that? You. I didn't tweet that. Oh, I thought it was you. It must have been Crockett. Yeah, yeah. I didn't tweet that. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Who tweeted that? Stop. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we died. <laughs> 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 anyway, so yeah, we had a really great chat with uh, Jonathan Barrio from CGN. and it was a it was a fantastic episode, and I know that you guys will like it. And you know, everything, all the information will be at some point in the in the, in description, the description below. below. But we'll make sure to pop in some of the some of the handles on the episode and whatnot. Yeah, check out the conversation with Jonathan. It was a great conversation, and we will see you guys all next week. Yeah, cheers. We are Venom. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good little tidbit at the end. <laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Drunken Ship Podcast. I believe that this is episode 65. 65. Yeah, episode 65. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again. As you notice, we have a guest in the studio, mm-hmm. Jonathan Barrio, the executive director and co-founder of the Charlotte Gamers Network, mm-hmm. um, who I had the opportunity to go to one of their events, the like I think like a week ago. This past Friday, this yeah, past October Friday, 1st. Yeah. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Really great time. Um so, you know, before we get into any conversation, why don't you tell us what, like, Charlotte Gamers is about? Sure. So the Charlotte Gamers Network is North Carolina's largest LGBTQIA plus gaming organization. Now, with that being said, we're very open to all of our allies participating with us. Whether you're gay or straight, no matter how you identify, we wanted to build this organization as something that gamers from all across Charlotte could find their home, could come to one of our events and meet people, network, enjoy what we have to offer and play games with one another. Nice. That's awesome. I, th- you guys are the only like LGBT gaming organization in Charlotte, right? Like, there's not a very, there's, there's not a market that's been tapped quite a bit. Yeah. So, th- so it, it is a little bit of an untapped market. There's one other organization called Stonewall Esports. Um, Stonewall Sports is the largest um, sports 
LGBT sporting organization here in Charlotte. And they do really fantastic work as well um, between hosting, you know, tournaments and they do seasons of play with volleyball, kickball, bowling, all sorts of kind of stuff. And they just open an esports uh, division of their organization. So we've, we've, we haven't done that much work with them, but we try to support each other and any way that we can. Thankfully, you know, they're really focusing on the tournament side of play, you know, arranging mm-hmm. tournaments and, and and what have you, while we're really focusing on the social networking and aspect of gaming and how gaming brings people together in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, they've been great to work with and, and, and the opportunities that we've had to have with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is an untapped market. You know, there's so many other, you know, straight identifying gaming organizations in Charlotte. Um, you know, esports is a very big thing here in this community. Right. Um, so it is kind of odd that there you wouldn't find more, you know, niche um, organizations. Yeah, when, I, when we went to the convention, we uh, noticed your, the company. I didn't know there was a thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's really cool they did this. That's why you got it on the show because it's like it's an mm-hmm. interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we, we started the Charlotte Gamers Network in the middle of the pandemic. So we've only been around for about 15 months. Yeah. We started in July of last year. And we wanted to do that because, as you know, you know, with the pandemic shuttering all of these businesses down, for a lot of LGBTQIA plus identifying folks, you know, a lot of our friends, a lot of our networking, a lot of us going out and enjoying each other's company – usually happens at a gay owned venue, whether it's a gay bar, a gay restaurant, what have you. So when all of that kind of shut down, most of us lost our social lives like that overnight. Um, you know, so um, Zach Smith, our other co-founder and I, we had this idea, well, let's bring these people together. Let's ensure that they have these virtual worlds in the very least to be able to meet up and network, whether it's a lobby in Warzone, whether it's fishing in Elder Scrolls Online or, or whatever it is, even playing Jackbox on a Discord. You know, we found ways to bring our people closer together than they ever were, you know, out before the pandemic even, you know, and I think because of us starting in the pandemic, it's really fostered these strong familial bonds where, you know, Brian, you were at the event and it's like, everybody knows everybody, you know, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it was, it's just so cool to see that. Yeah. And it really is like everybody knows everybody. I, I mean, I showed up, no, that was my first event and mm-hmm. I felt, I think I go to a lot of gaming events because I'm just interested in like, you know, we cover gaming, we cover entertainment, we do all of that. So I want to talk to all of these people. And like CGN was like the first one where I was just like, oh, it isn't weird. It feels like home. Yeah. There's not like a weird, there's not like a weird click. And there's also like a really interesting sense of like, because I'm not straight either. I'm pansexual. Mm -hmm. And so not being like, like that just weirds a lot of like straight like straight based avenues out mm-hmm. and a lot of like the culture around gaming is so predominantly like toxically masculine mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so like it, it was it was just really nice to like experience that and like not be in a spot where like I had to like be guarded yeah you know it's very interesting because we're we're, we're seeing this this odd shift um whereas you know a lot of our gamers when they first started coming to our events and we hosted gaming events excuse me around town um, you know, they would ask us, you know, is this a venue that's accepting? You know, is this a venue that's going to allow me and my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, whoever it may be, are we safe here? Now, fast forward a month, we're, I, I can't tell you how many times we've had straight people email us, call us, come to our events. Is this okay if I'm here? You know, I'm straight. Like, right. can I be here? Like, can I be in this space? Is that okay with you? Like, I've, I've never experienced that in my life, you know? So it's really, really cool to see that, you know, even within the last year with everything happening in America and all of that, you know, you're seeing this huge paradigm shift in how people think and and, and talk to one another and, and how they deal with one another and how they want to make sure that, you know, they're, they're being as open as possible to, you know, their neighbors around them, yeah. you know, so it's been really, really interesting to see that. And then I think the other thing that sets us apart, gay or straight, out of any organization, gaming or not, in Charlotte, is that we are one of the only events in this community that offers all of our guests, no matter where you come from, no matter if you're an elected official, a banker, or a college kid, or or somebody even living in your car, we don't care. The big thing that we want to do is bring our community together and not have that be restricted by a paywall or, or tickets or anything like that. And in that in that realm, we offer everybody a free hot meal we do an open bar featuring liquor, beer, and wine, live DJs, drag queens, entertainment. Everything is free of charge. We don't charge a single dollar for any of this. And then people ask, well, how the hell can you pull this off? You know, how are you doing this? 
you know, and thankfully we're very blessed to have the investors and donors and sponsors that that have given us product or, or financial contributions to be able to to do this. And so from doing that, we've we've seen the connections that we're able to build where, you know, you have, you know, a, a Charlotte city commissioner in the same room with, you know, a kid working at McDonald's, you right. know, you, you don't see those types of people, you know, interfacing with one another so openly. That's not a business networking kind of thing, you know? So it's, it's very interesting in that way too. That makes sense. So w- what is, what is your story? Like, I'm, I'm assuming you've been a gamer for like a long time. Like what's your story? What led you to like wanting to, you started at the pandemic, but what led you wanting to like start creating these safe spaces that mm-hmm. people could like just vibe in? So this, this goes back a little ways. Um, so I'm originally from Miami beach. I moved to Charlotte two years, three years ago now. Um, and in Miami growing up, I was Republican. I was the son of Cuban exiles who worked for Batista's government in Cuba. And when Castro took over and all that, the whole family fled the, uh, the island. So fast forward to my childhood and growing up, you know, I was very involved civically in that realm. I came out as gay, um, became a Democrat, started working in the movement. Um, and then I founded my first organization, gave us a social club in Miami, which was a, a, fraternal networking organization for gay men. Um, and the the whole point of that group was to give people, you know, as, a, as in any big city, as I'm, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, you know, drugs and alcohol are, are very rampant, especially in our community. Right. So we wanted to create an environment where we took young gay men away from those triggers, away from, from, from that world. And, you know, whereas we didn't have a problem with anybody going to the bar. But we wanted to show our community that there's so many things out there to really explore the beauty of Miami, to show our community that there's so many other things to do besides just going to a bar, you know, and that kind of started me on my journey from there, from working in in the political world, from doing fundraising and development, um, and then moving to Charlotte and then starting the Charlotte Gamers Network, seeing that need in this community to want to build and and bring these people closer together and offer them that, that way to network and connect. What brought you to Charlotte? My fiance took a job as a uh, Wall Street attorney. So nice we ended well. up coming here to Charlotte. <laughs> we we're originally going to move to New York. Thank God we didn't because it was right before the pandemic and that would have sucked. Oh, that would have been a nightmare. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> horrible. Horrible. You like Charlotte? You like it weird? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, it, it's it's growing on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I like Charlotte a lot more than I thought I would. Um, you That's know, the journey of everyone that moves. I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. I can straight from the island. Oh, wow. The same, same situation. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, ah, Charlotte's fine. Yeah, right, exactly. Keep growing into it. <laughs> I don't think anyone, yeah, we're no one is originally from Charlotte here. No. Mm-hmm. Well, that's my thing is that I'm so used to, you know, when my family immigrated to America, half of my family to this day still lives in New York City, and then the other half lives in Miami. Right. So, you know, I spend my time between both, between the city and between Miami growing up through my young adult life. And, and I, you know, I work in New York now. I just work remote. So, you know, I was always used to kind of the rat race, you know, whereas we're in Charlotte, everything is just chill. You know, it's, it's tranquilo, you know, here it's very calm. Um, suave. It's suave, bro. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that I think is the most getting used to. No, it's so funny because both me and him, he can relate. We're from a small town. Mm-hmm. So come here, it's like, God, this is fast. <laughs> wow. Everything's so much closer. Yeah, it's, like, and everything. <laughs> like, it's a big city. Yeah. It's not even that big. Yeah. But like, comparatively, yeah. it's massive. You're like 30 minutes away from my hometown. And yeah. Like, Jesus. Well, like our mayor, Vi Lyles, always says, you know, it's uh, Charlotte's a big city with that small town feel. You <laughs> yeah. Know? That is so <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's super interesting how like how quickly like Charlotte is growing and like mm-hmm. developing. Yeah. Cause like, I, I mean, I've been here 10 years and in those 10 years, it's been incredibly, like it's changed so fucking much mm-hmm. since we first started um, or since I've been here at all. And I keep seeing like, when I first came in here, it was like this sort of very Republican, like it was kind of dodgy. Like wherever you talk to, they might tell you to go back to Mexico or you might be <laughs> okay. Like it was like really hit or miss. And now it's like totally not the case. I've seen such a big shift like politically mm-hmm. in Charlotte that it's crazy. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big thing. I mean, look at, you know, city council, you know, we have a nine to two majority on council right now of Democrats to Republicans. And, you know, with this redistricting of, of these city seats, you know, we, we may, we might lose another um, Republican spot as well. So it might be 10 to one. Um, 
it, it is very interesting. You know, the, the one thing that I hope Charlotte doesn't lose is that, you know, I think that the, those transference of ideas, you know, is important and brings everybody closer together to their community, you know, whether it's civically or, or, or what have you, you know, I, I think that's important. Right. Um, but even outside of that, the political world of Charlotte, I mean, just look at all the development happening. You know, I think that's the next big conversation that, you know, people in Charlotte have to reckon with is, you know, the effects of gentrification. You know, if you look at NODA, like it's, you know, very commercialized now yeah. um, and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's really interesting to see. So you mentioned you were like civically involved. Mm -hmm. What did that mean over like when you were in Miami? Do you still work in, in civics and then like in sort of that kind of field or like are you? So in Miami, I was appointed by the mayor of Miami Beach to sit on two advisory committees. Um, so the LGBTQ advisory committee and the Hispanic affairs committee. Um, so in, in, in that world, I worked with the city and the city commissioners and the mayor to, um, along with our team, to advise them on issues impacting the LGBTQ community and the Hispanic community. Um, here in Charlotte, I serve on, this, on the community relations committee as well. Um, where we deal with a lot of things pertaining to Charlotte's residents, um, issues ranging from there. Our, our committee recently worked with the city of Charlotte to enact Charlotte's first uh, non-discrimination ordinance. Um, so we're really, really excited about that work. Okay. Um, and then outside of that, I also do um, political fundraising. So my, my nine to five job is I, I work at an organization called SAGE, Services and Advocacy for JLBT Elders, where we raise money to house um, LGBT seniors and elders in housing complexes in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever even heard of that being an issue before. Like that was, oh, it's a huge yeah. issue. It's a huge issue. You know, something that we're that is so unfortunate that we're finding out is that you know, look at Stonewall, which was a riot that led to the LGBT movement. You know, Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman, you know, leading leading that charge. And what people are failing to realize is that you know there are a lot of people in the '60s that contributed to that. You know, a lot of people our age in their 20s and their 30s, you know, who now are retiring, who were fierce advocates for the LGBTQ community. And now in their, in their you know, golden years, in their old age, they're being forced back into the closet, not because of the staff of these assisted living facilities or anything like that, but because of the other residents that are living with them. So people, like, it's it's been very difficult for people to understand that, like, how damaging that can be and all of that. So what our organization does is to make sure that we're moving those folks who can into our housing facilities in Brooklyn and the Bronx. And then for those who can't, we run a national program where we do accredited trainings with assisted living facilities to teach them about LGBTQ competency and, and all of that for elders. That's incredible. How long have you been doing that? For about a year. Just celebrated my, my year anniversary. Nice. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's a crazy important work. I imagine that that kind of work also like ties in with what you're trying to do here in Charlotte with the like the CGN mm -hmm. and just in general, just like providing safe spaces. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's something that's that's so deeply needed. Um, you know, when, when you look at Charlotte and the gaming community here, you know, another great organization is the Athena Alliance, mm -hmm. which is a which is a women led gaming organization. It's all women, and they're fabulous. Yeah. You know, shout out to Emmy Venner who who runs the organization. Shout out. <laughs> um, but uh, but that's the thing is that we've managed to find our our groups. And you mentioned earlier about you know how you're surprised that things aren't so clickish with CGN, right? And and all of that, you know. And that's something that we try so very hard to make sure it never happens. Um, and why we try to be opening and welcoming to everybody because we don't want CGN to be in this little tiny box for this little group of people. We're like that, we want this to expand as big as possible and be something for everybody. Right. Yeah, and and I mean, I think you guys are succeeding. Like from the moment I joined the Discord and the moment I met you guys, I mean, Keelan immediately welcomed me in, and then like mm -hmm. just everybody in the Discord has been such a lovely. Like every time that I show up there and interact, everybody's like super excited about something. <laughs> Um, it really is like a lovely experience and something that I feel because like we are in the and we're gamers and like we mm -hmm. cover gaming and we cover media and that's like what I feel like is missing the most out of gaming and gaming media in general. It's just kind of like that social element, mm -hmm. like which is ironic because we play so many games socially, but it all feels so exclusionary. Mm -hmm. And so sort of like judgy and gatekeepy. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just glad that there are other organizations out there that are like taking that and like trying to like fight against that. Because mm -hmm. I think it's really important to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and I think the, the, the biggest thing that we that we really try to foster also is partnerships. 
you know, I think what CGN does the best is partnering with other organizations to effectuate that kind of work. Um, another great organization that we do a lot of work with is the Charlotte Phoenix and Stay Plugged In. Um, I don't know if you all know, but Charlotte has its very own franchise kind of esports team that has. I actually did not know that. Yeah, I found out. Yeah. High school. My sister goes to. Really? Yeah, they have esports stuff there. Man, what a what, a, what an yeah. age to be alive! <laughs> I remember getting bullied for fucking liking Pokemon. Right, <laughs> it just changed over time. Like, wow, it shocked me. I saw it in a high school. Like, what is this? Well, yeah. so you bring up a really good point. So yeah. what I love about Stay Plugged In and what the Charlotte Phoenix does is that the Charlotte Phoenix is the esports arm of the organization, where they run teams in Valorant, Overwatch League, Rocket Smash League, Smash Bros. Too, right? Smash Bros. Yeah. Um, and they actually have the number two World of Warcraft PvP team in the world. That's amazing. Oh my God. Which is like so it's so random, right? Like. <laughs> What a great batch of honor. I know. It's a really, really great group of people. So you have that on that side. And then Stay Plugged In is the education side the um, that, that works with schools and all of that. And the big thing that they're focusing on right now is what, what you were just mentioning about high school, mm -hmm. is that especially for people of color, especially for marginalized people of color, you don't really have traditional ways um, into high school, except for like a sports program or something like that, you know? And so what, what they're really focusing on is that, no, like that's fucked up. Like, let's do what we can to ensure that people who do not have traditional routes to college have access to these scholarships. So that's why these esports programs are so huge right now because they, I, they are now giving these kids, that's insane. you know, who are playing call of duty and yeah. all that a way to play for scholarships and go to college. That's and, this is crap. Wow. I yeah. got robbed out of my childhood. Dude, that sounds insane. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, because I was, I was at my, picking my sister up from high school and I saw it in the office. It was an eSports thing. And mm -hmm. that's what you just mentioned just now. And that's, that's insane. Yeah, that, that is crazy. Play I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I knew that we were getting to the point where eSports was becoming this, like this big cultural thing. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that we were at the point where we were trying to like get scholarships and like try to get that involved in the, mm -hmm. I don't know, just like in getting resources to people. That's fucking crazy. So at your guys' events, do you guys run any tournaments or anything like that? We do. So at every gamer gathering, we run a Smash tournament. We're going to probably change up the game. I think we're going to do Mortal Kombat next. But um, but that's the other thing. We want people to have the opportunity to come to our event for free, put some bucks in their pocket. Um, our tournaments never have any entry fees, and they all have um, uh, cash prize oh, right. winnings. Yeah. So we do 50 bucks, uh, and, we'll, and that will – increase as we get more funding and all that kind of stuff. You guys should do a uh, Tetris. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> These two freaks right here went for like a year long Tetris phase. Yeah. They would get, get some tent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tetris, yeah, Tetris is like pretty, <laughs> you wouldn't think like Tetris being like a competitive game, but it can be so competitive. I guess with like, well, Tetris 99, mm -hmm. people oh, really started. I, you know, I never even played it too. One of the, sadly one of the best Switch games. <laughs> Tetris ninety nine. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because you know Jordan like talking about you can turn anything into esports these days. And I was just reading an article on uh, Kotaku where they were going into this whole thing where Stardew Valley has an esports really esports do, component now. How does that work? How, yeah. Do they speed run it? I guess they speed run it. And the grand prize was like 250 Gs. Jesus wow. Like Christ. It's like insane, man. I mean, it's, it's yeah, the, the world of esports is, I, I think, the next big frontier. I think the issue that people are having is how does it remain profitable? Because if you look at any esports team right now, maybe besides Team Envy, you know, like, and maybe besides FaZe Clan, but like all of those esports teams are really well known, but it they're not, it, it's not profitable. And, and it's wondering like how, you know, how can we make this into... A bigger thing like football right. and baseball and, and and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Is esports still in that weird light where people don't take it seriously enough? You know, it's it's now getting coverage on ESPN and 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 things like that. Yeah, I remember people complain about that when it happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I I think what people don't understand is that you know, for instance, here's another great story. You know, there was a 16 year old kid I think three or four years ago who won a Fortnite tournament and won like a prize money. Like oh, I yeah, dollars. I remember this. Yeah, and ESPN zooms in on the kid, does an interview with the kid, and the first question they ask him is, you just won $4 million at 16 years old. What do you? What's the first thing you're going to buy? Looks straight into the camera and says, you know what? All I really want is a new desk. And the cameraman and the anchor, you could just see, like, what the fuck just written on their face. <laughs> but, but that's the thing is that I, I don't think, like, people realize – you know, that this could be a career. And now you have all these branching paths. So, you know, another great thing that Stay Plugged In does is education with the parents. 
So when their kids come and play, the parents go off into a room or, or, or whatever, and they talk with other like famous esports players. You know, I was just at their office the other day and James Bickford was there doing a promo with them. Who's James, James Bickford? James Bickford is a, is Jeff Gordon's cousin oh. and is a NASCAR driver and okay. is driving the Charlotte Phoenix car. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, and, and he's like a 23 year old kid, super cool guy, like was, and was just there chilling, hanging with the guys, you know? So it's, it's stuff like that where if the parents can be shown that, Hey, like this could actually be a career. Because even to your point, even six months ago, even a year ago, when people didn't take esports seriously, there wasn't a trajectory there. You know, you either played Modern Warfare and you were the biggest fucking thing in the world and and you won all this prize money in your set. Now, you know, if you go into esports and you're not that great, well, hey, now you can be a caster and go to and stream. You can be a streamer full time, um, you know, like Shroud and, and all those guys. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many different areas that you can go into now. And that's that. Um, revolves around esports and, and gaming where people can actually turn it into a career. And then you have organizations like Stay Plugged In and Charlotte Phoenix who have these huge teams and employees and all that where they do content creation, social media creation, you know, casting, all this kind of stuff, you know, running camps. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see how far the industry has come just within the last year. Yeah. And I, and I feel like that's going to continue being like, like just the trend as like we figure out because apart from like sponsorships or anything like that, like I feel like it, like you said, it's really challenging to make it profitable because the cost of entry is so big mm -hmm. in making content creation and like forming a career and that, that. I would love to see as soon as that like cost of entry continues breaking down, which it has been for a little while, how massive and amazing it'll be to see just the industry grow like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a cool thing that like something that used to be like a, I don't know, just kind of like a point of safety or like something that you had to hide from other people that you do to make yourself feel good, not becoming like this massive popular thing. And it's like, it's not, I mean, it's, it, a lot of it is thanks to people like you that are like, mm -hmm. like fighting to make it culturally relevant. I think it's, it's just great. It's just great to see it. Yeah. And, you know, I think you bring up another great point too. You know, the, what's really interesting about this industry is that it's getting younger and younger and younger as well. You mentioned game creation and content creation. Mm -hmm. Well, Look at things like Roblox, you know, mm -hmm. some of the things that these 10 year old kids are making on there. It's like, holy crap, like you're talented. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I say Minecraft YouTubers have better problem solving skills than 50 year old engineers. Yeah, right. It's crazy. <laughs> like, there's a, there's a place that she came called Dream. She may have heard of it. And yeah, of course. Just making games in this mm -hmm. at a young age, like they learn how to, because it's a basic engine. You can yeah. play. Mm -hmm. People are just making their own products with that. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy to see how things will rapidly change from Cause like the, I remember, I remember being a kid and like, you know, games like Xbox, PlayStation one, two and all that, the older, those kids, cause I remember starting at that, like at that like level. Mm -hmm. Right. And then growing up and being able to flip that from being a, like, but I got started off at an early in age and it seems like the younger and younger, these kids are getting started off with those like level entry things just how like branching off and like streaming and all of that is coming more and more popular because these kids are like, they grew up with them, mm -hmm. but not necessarily like the parents and stuff and how like they take like go the esports like having to go in and explain it to those parents. The more and more like generations they grow up, it's the less they're going to have to even explain to the parents and it's more probably going to be even understanding. Like if I had kids now, I am very aware of like what's going on and like with streaming and, esports mm -hmm. and all that and i know how valuable that is to like a lot of the like, communities mm -hmm. yeah you know i mean i think you raise a really good point too i, I think we're especially parents struggle and personally where i would struggle you know if if i had kids we just my fiance has two nephews that just spent the summer with us and you know i look at them they're not they're not tenants i'm gonna fuck this up 10 and 8 i think <laughs> 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 they're young boys but you know i look at that and it's such a fine line because where does you know, where you give a kid an iPad or a phone, you mm -hmm. know, and they live on that tablet for all day long, mm -hmm. you know, and then of course that's going to, they're going to want the next big thing. They want to go to an Xbox, to a PlayStation. It's how do you foster that, but in a healthy way? So right. I think that's the biggest struggle right now where, you know, I'm sure all of you, all of us, you know, we're on Xbox live when we were 11 years old on Call of Duty, oh, yeah. you know, oh, on yeah. Warfare 2 and just hearing the stuff that we heard on Xbox Live 10 <laughs> yeah. years ago. Crazy. You know, <laughs> should not is, have been allowed. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, and, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, I was mentioning earlier, you know, everything happening in society, even the last year, especially in the aftermath of George Floyd and the election of Biden and, and all of this kind of stuff. 
you know, it's our, our communities are, I feel like our, our communities are closer together than they ever were in, in our immediate circles. Mm -hmm. But out there in the world, I mean, things are just becoming more and more toxic and crazy and, and people just looking to fight all the time. Yeah. And, all that. So, you know, it, it is a very fine line on how do you how do you nurture that that need that want for technology mm -hmm. in in a productive way. Yeah, something that doesn't absolutely like destroy your mental health. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that, I feel like that is that is the biggest struggle, like just considering mental health and like how some of these kids are like jumping into a field where they're constantly scrutinized, constantly criticized, constantly sort of verbally abused, mm -hmm. and then having to like, oh, yeah, well, this is healthy. This is what I want to do, and like not have that burnout feeling. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just wild to me that we got to that point as a culture because it's, it's. It's, it's making just, me think right now, like how far we come. Because I never thought about any of this as a kid. Just, just simply playing video games. I never thought totally. it could be someone's career. Yeah, we're or just making, playing Spyro and hanging yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, just hanging out. <laughs> but now it's like they're they like, making money and getting like scholarships. Let's. Wow. And not only that, I mean, we're also now struggling. Like, it's it's such a double-edged sword, too, when you really think about it. Because, you know, this is a big conversation in CGN right now. Oh, my God, was it a big, big debate. Diablo 2 just came out. Yeah. Resurrected. You know, I remember playing Diablo 2 when I was, like, eight years old. That's you right. You know, always come back to school, play that all day long. But, you know, a lot of our people were like, well, hey, you know, are you sure we should be playing this with everything happening with Activision Blizzard? You know, should we be supporting a company that's doing this? But it's like when you think about it, when you really sit there and think about it, Activision Blizzard just got caught with their hands down. You know, yeah. like look at Ubisoft, what's happening in Singapore and the exploitation of mm. these Singaporean nationals for tax benefits in France and in, and all of this rock star. I didn't even know about that. Oh, yeah. It's it's crazy. When you look down, like every AAA studio has baggage, right? Games yeah. had all the sexual harassment suits. And then it's the other side of it where... Most of these allegations, especially, you know, with Activision Blizzard, were always directed towards women. Mm -hmm. You know, we come from a different sphere and look at it. Well, look at Rockstar Games, the creators of Red Dead Redemption, Grand Theft Auto. Their executive vice president was a man who was her sexually harassing interns, male interns and, right. and things like that. But nobody heard about that. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one article about it, you know. So so I, I think that it's such a deep-rooted problem in the industry when you talk about – and then crunch is a whole other thing. Yeah. Like Sadly. the the, yeah. the hours that these poor people have to work. Yeah. You know, so again, it goes back to the conversation of, you know, how can you be an ethical consumer in with capitalism and, and, and all of that? Because if you want to boycott Activision Blizzard, well, hey, you should be boycotting the entire gaming industry. Yeah. And that's kind of like that's kind of the, the the biggest challenge because the same thing happened with the with the Me Too movement when mm -hmm. it like affected. I'm a movie guy, so like when the Me Too movement affected, you know, like the entire Hollywood industry, Miramax is the third biggest film distributor that happened. Two of my favorite directors belong to Miramax. You know, like it's it's so pervasive through, throughout the entire industry that the the challenge of knowing when to separate what is happening versus like the product that you're consuming and how like the hierarchy is split, you know, mm -hmm. like like the developers that made these games are as much a victim of like the power structure that exists there. Mm -hmm. And so like not supporting specific parts of the game industry also means kind of collapsing that livelihood. And like, it's just such a big puzzle piece to figure mm -hmm. out and like separating the the game from the, from the studio and like, where are you, like what's your comfort level with like playing, like still playing Call of Duty or still playing, mm -hmm. Warzone after like the whole Activision what a, thing. What a fucking mess yeah. that yeah, is. Because like imagine like you just went to your job. You just went to do your job, right? Mm -hmm. And then some dudes like now you're getting fired because they can't pay you because like your boss decided to like sexually harass somebody. Mm -hmm. And the people went a like, hard time into the, the game development mm -hmm. and now people have this idea that you can't support it sadly. Because the garbage people. It takes there. one yeah. dickhead to fuck up. Yeah, it does. For yeah. Yeah. It's like you see the Activision games. Like I'm a huge Spiral fan, and I'm waiting for Spiral Four. But you see all this crap with Activision. It's mm -hmm. like, and I would feel garbage. Not gonna lie about it if I buy the game. But I'm also a huge fan. I also understand the people who, like Jordan said, innocent people just come there to do work. Totally. And it's garbage people there just messing it all up. You know, and that's yeah. that's the thing that's so interesting to me is that it's such a Western problem. Yes. You know, when you talk about like America and France and. Um, Canada, you know, the game studios there that that this culture is so pervasive. I mean, you ain't hearing about this at Nintendo. No. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, that's what's so <laughs> crazy to me. You know, it's 
to, to your point too, I think the other thing is that the game industry itself is such a young industry. Yeah. And I think it's it's mostly comprised of, you know, these older white men. Older white men. <laughs> yeah. and, and now you also have a lot of like white tech bros and yeah. all of that that are jumping into the industry. And, you know, I, I don't know if any of you saw Mythic Quest, but but that TV show is such is so indicative of the development process. Does it call again? Mythic Quest. Mythic Quest. Yeah. Really amazing show about game development oh, on Apple TV. You gotta watch it. It's really, really good. But um but yeah, I mean it's I think the biggest question now is that you know, Bobby Kotick, the CEO of Activision, is still making $130 million a year. Yeah, you right. know, there's nothing happening there, you know, and he's the top dog at, at Activision Blizzard. You know, so so that's kind of like how do we where do we go from here? You know, and what's gonna happen in the fallout of this investigation by the SEC, the state of California, and all of that, right. you know, against Activision Blizzard. And, you know, what's gonna happen to all these other people? No, we well, sorry to cut you off, but um we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. And like, you know, Call of Duty is a huge franchise. Mm -hmm. Not everyone knows his story. So how does that benefits them? Like he's they're still making a lot of money despite being an issue. Of course, because so how do they fix that? Or how do they you know, that's the thing. And and it's something that you know uh, you can't like gamers will never boycott yeah. Call of Duty. Nah. There's just no way. There's too much money in it. And and that's the thing. When you have all these other industries depending on Activision Blizzard, because remember, I mean the biggest esports games are Call of Duty, Overwatch, yeah. you know, all their yeah. IPs. You know, so how can you ever do anything? You know, I mean, look what happened with that um that player from Hong Kong, you know, that that was streaming Hearthstone and then said like free Taiwan or something and oh, during, I remember oh, yeah, that during yeah, the yeah. thing yeah. And, and Blizzard. Oh, that was a minute ago. That was a minute ago. Yeah. And you feel like you feel like that was like years ago, but yeah. it was like eight months ago, nine Wait, months ago. Really? Yeah. It was not even that long <laughs> I remember ago. That. Yeah. <laughs> That's how, oh, wow. but that's how inherently problematic the industry has become at this point, and mm -hmm. how, how hard it is to navigate. Because there's a new story every other fucking day. It's endemic within the industry. Yeah. That, that's that's the problem. Is that you know you're asking how do we fix this? I have no fucking clue because gaming is a beast, just like Hollywood is a beast. Yeah. You know the show must go on. You change the characters. And that's about all you can do, yeah. you know. Really, apart from like burning it all down and starting over, it's like almost almost impossible to like redirect. Which will also be impossible as long as you know Eve's uh, GMA over at Ubisoft is running Ubisoft, and you have Bobby Kotick took over Activision Blizzard. Yeah, you know, as as long as those people are are in play, you know, that's going to be next to impossible. You know, and and that's a thing too. You know, at least we're not dealing with like all the racism and crazy shit that's happening in France with. Ubisoft and, and what they're doing, because I feel like that is like even way crazier than what's happening here in America in the game industry. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's nuts, man. It's nuts. It, it, it's it's a crazy world that we live in. Shit's just kind of falling apart at the cracks. And like, especially like, like once COVID happened, it's just like, which is why an organization like yours exists, because you mm -hmm. kind of jumped in to like fill the cracks of like just social need. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like once COVID happened, everything just kind of like started falling apart at the seams in terms of like, like masks started falling off. Like we started seeing a lot of like how the way that people like treat employees and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And it's just, it's just wild to me that we live in a state or we live in a state of being where like every other day. People make things complicated for no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something <laughs> horrible happens. Yeah. Well, it's changing the psyche of how we all think about our day-to-day -day life. I mean, you know, they're calling that this last year and a half the great resignation. You know, mm -hmm. all these Americans who are leaving their jobs in droves because they discovered during the pandemic, like, fuck, if this is all my life is, you know, I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, so I think, you know, it's the pandemic has forced so many of us to do so much soul searching and figure out what really is important to us and where do we want to prioritize our time. And it was through that process why CGN was created mm -hmm. because, you know, Zach and, and I sat down and we were like, you know, how can we make this community a better place? How can we put our talents into this and give back yeah. to the people who've given back to us? So, so let me ask you this. Sorry, mm -hmm. I don't mean to cut you off. But sure. Was it like a purposeful thing where you were like, I want to make an organization that does this and this? Or did you just find yourself in a community of people and it just grew from there? That's a great question, Brian. So we absolutely did not set out to create CGN as it's known today. Right. Um, it started off as a Facebook group chat. You know, it was five of us who were meeting up to play Warzone. We would we would play Warzone every Wednesday. And that was our time where we'd spend an hour. We would all squat up. We'd all get into a voice chat and we'd just talk about how the day went and all that. 
And that group of five turned into a group of 10, turned into a group of 20, turned into a group of 40. And then we all moved to Elder Scrolls Online and then arranged like fishing days and stuff like that. <laughs> and we all just chill with the boys. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. And, and from there, you know, Zach and I had this light bulb idea and we're like, holy shit we have something here. You know, people right. were calling us, asking us like, hey, when's the next event? When are you guys doing this? And that was the birth of the Charlotte Gamers Network. That's crazy. And when did you guys start doing like the, the in real life meetups? So we started in July of the pandemic last year. Our first event was a Halloween event in October. Oh, wow. Three so months after This is that. almost the, the anniversary. Yeah. 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 Sick. Of the, of the first Gamer Gathering. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Do you need like anniversary events or anything? So we always celebrate our anniversary in July. We celebrate Founders Day in, in July. And then we'll have um, Gamer Gathering, by the way, that that October event, the mm -hmm. very first Gamer Gathering was at Tabris. So we've okay. hosted that Gamer Gathering. This is like the 13th edition of it. That's amazing. That's always been at, at Tabris. Um, and that's our thing is that we produce three events a month. We have a Halloween event coming up on October 27th at Pins Mechanical. Nice. And we're going to do a costume contest with a grand prize of $100 for whoever is the best mm. dressed. So it's going to be... Time to pull out that, uh, that Gimp Tokyo Ghoul mask. <laughs> <laughs> I hate the costume. I probably, I probably can't fit into the leather suit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's pretty sick man that's yeah. that's great um and yeah it just seems wild to me how like the like when there's a need to fill like a social niche like it'll get filled i mean you guys are up to what eight seven hundred eight and, like Ooh. members right um now? i think that number is probably around 12 1300 when, oh, you, wow. when, that's when you consider all all portions of our of our database yeah um it's a big group it's a big group and it's a lot of fun i mean we always have a great time and i think you know the next big thing that we're undertaking is actually going to conventions like we produced at queen city anime con yeah and working with our community to do bigger things like that you do a lot this started from a chat right <laughs> started from a facebook chat, group it's chat here man does that blow your mind <laughs> blows my mind man i mean when you when when i sit back and think about it it's like you know i truly do believe in like and this is going to sound so stupid and cliche, but like things like the butterfly effect, yeah. you know, like the flapping of one butterfly's wings can lead to a hurricane somewhere else, you know, like yeah. those very small calculated actions, sometimes not even calculated at all, just actions that happen, just you know, can lead to, and to all these other amazing things, um, you know. And, and for instance, for me, you know, I never went to college. You know, I graduated from high school and I decided college wasn't for me. And just through my network and through meeting people and, and just being who I am, you know, that's always led to all of these amazing opportunities. And, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate enough to live a very privileged and a, and a very blessed life because of that, you know. So, so I really want to share those gifts with, with everybody that I can, you know. And that's how CGN sees itself. That's how we propagate our message and how we bring people closer together. Because there's so many people in our leadership team and our volunteers and our sponsors who, who have that same feeling. You know, if you have a big enough vision, you can fit everybody in, into it. You can have a seat at that table for every single person. And I think that's how we've been able to build such a diverse group of folks. I mean, you were there. I mean, yeah. there's, I'm hard pressed to think of another place where you can go and find such a diverse group of people from trans folks, black folks, white folks, Hispanic folks, you know, people who identify however, however they like, you know, it's such a cool melting pot in mm -hmm. that way. And it truly does feel like a piece of Charlotte. It really does. And then the, the thing that struck me, because they haven't been to the event, but I'm taking them with me to the next event. Yeah, well, well, I was supposed to go, but yeah. you, you didn't, tell, like, you yeah, didn't so take me. I was, I was feeling sad, and I was just like, I'm just going to go by myself. <laughs> 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 um, but it, it really is crazy how, like, it's such a diverse group of people, but one that is constantly just absorbing more people into itself. Mm -hmm. Like, there's never a moment really where, like, it feels discriminatory and i remember like that was that was an instance where like a straight person felt not particularly welcome and you called it out in front of the group mm -hmm. which is something that's like really amazing that doesn't happen mm -hmm. particularly often there's there's always a lot of conflict about mm -hmm. that absolutely and and you know in that instance in particular it, it, it wasn't anybody you know necessarily saying anything to, right. to disrespect anybody it was literally just this straight person was like hey i feel super uncomfortable being at a gay event am i supposed to be here right. like am i taking space away from another person of the lgbtq community yeah you know, so so that's again, and that's the big thing is is making sure that everybody knows that everybody is welcome. You know, that anybody can come to this event. How do you navigate that? Like the larger you become, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think we're learning as we go. Um, I, I think you know a very important aspect of that is ensuring that our leadership team is comprised 
of everybody from our community. I mean, we have a very diverse leadership team with people who identify, you know, in many different ways. Right. Um, you know, we have a lot of racial diversity on our team, a lot of gender diversity on our team, um, and then just, again, backgrounds too. You know, you mentioned something earlier too that, you know, CGN truly has this family branding almost mm -hmm. because of what we're able to build. And again, no matter who you are or where you come from, when you sit behind one of those screens and you pick up that controller, it doesn't make if you it doesn't matter if you make a million dollars or you make ten dollars. Yeah, you know that gaming in itself is such an equalizing experience because unless you're playing a game like Call of Duty or Halo or whatever like that, you know if you're playing Mario Kart or Super Smash Bros or Mario Party for fun or whatever, you know it doesn't matter who you are. You know when you pick up that controller, you're transported somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know and you're playing a game with people you like around you, and and what we found too is that what better icebreaker can there be between two strangers than sitting down at a table and picking up a game? Yeah, you know and getting to know one another through that. So no, that's true. It's like Squid Games is equal footing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now you said uh, uh, how I was about the butterfly flick that took you here, but I think it's more like you're really passionate about this. And yeah. That took, I think that took you the most, like how much you're passionate about how you're LGBT, LGBT, I can't say the word. LGBTQ. Yeah, that and also video games. You just want mm -hmm. the community to come together. Mm -hmm. it's, like, again, it's a family. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's my thing too is that, you know, what I love about our team is that they all have the same passion that I do. You know, there's varying levels, of course. You know, I'm, I'm always going to be extremely passionate about this organization because I co-founded right. it. Um, but the, the the really great thing about gaming is that the four of us sitting here at this table, I'm sure, can remember the exact moment we played a video game. Mm -hmm. yep. The first the first game that we loved. Yeah. You know, the the way we felt, you know, when we... You know, for me, it's like when we connected four TVs on LAN cables all over the house and played yes. Halo 2. <laughs> some Halo 2, baby. You know, you're coming, that was like the best thing on the planet, you know? And and so that's the other thing is that we're able to tap into an experience that nearly everyone has had in their life, you know, because again, we don't only do video games. We do board games, D&D, &D, all sorts of stuff like that. So even if you don't have the video game experience, I'm sure as hell you can remember when you played a board game with your grandmother yeah. or with your father or with your family or whatever, and you have those positive experiences around this activity. There's, you can't say that a lot about a lot of other things. Yeah, that's true. You know, just mm -hmm. crushing my family in Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said. Like, if I'd never played my first video game, I wouldn't be probably the person who I am today. Mm -hmm. That's crazy how that one thing can change your Boring blob. Yeah, I, I just think, <laughs> think of what I would be doing. Well, like, and that's <laughs> and that's a really great point because that's my my bigger mission around video gaming is to educate people that games are not just something to sit there and, and big, explore. You're big language right now. Right. And, yes. and like, my thing yeah. is like, like, and talking about multimedia and talking mm -hmm. about Hollywood. I mean, look at some of the scripts, like the last of us. Dude, I mean, you're just speaking my language. Right? Dude, it's like, <laughs> like these are, yeah. these games are telling stories yes. that would be impossible to tell on the screen. Absolutely. You know, uh, yeah. We're uh, going to find out on when HBO adapts this TV show. So we'll <laughs> see how that goes. But, um, but yeah, when you think about like, the Last of Us and and even Bioshock, like yeah. like I can remember playing that game when I was like thirteen years old and I saw that ending and I was like, this is this is more of a mind fuck. <laughs> Would than you like kindly seven. like <laughs> just like whoa? Yeah. Yeah, like oh my god, no I way! I tell people this all the time too. Like video games, uh, people just think oh just. Like you said, it's just for bored of playing games. But you look at them, it's an art form. Mm -hmm. You oh, see yeah. these stories, like God of War. Oh, my gosh. Of oh, course. My, God of War made me cry. Yeah, I'm yeah. investing into this world, game. dude. Yeah. And, like, just listening to Mimir, just talking. I'm mm -hmm. enjoying the hell out of it. Can I just say, I just mm -hmm. want to touch on this for I uh, lose it. Um, just how great it is that, like, you're doing a, like, LAN kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. because I, I, me I remember, like, how, like, because you can, like, playing online is, like, a magical, exp it's, it's magical. It's, like, mm -hmm. to play, like, with somebody that's across the world. So, but playing next to somebody, mm -hmm. it's a whole nother like level of things. Cause I remember like when I was a little kid going past a, like a FYE or something and they had a T like a C CVR TV outside. CRT. C yeah. <laughs> with a, uh, with Halo 2 on it mm -hmm. and just being able to sit down next to like some complete stranger and have a blast for the next 25 minutes mm -hmm. just playing against each other and stuff. And then that's super special. And that's very, very very nice to have. That, Absolutely. That's amazing that you guys are doing that for like a, just also even with like just providing free food and cash prizes and all this stuff. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, poor or what, but it's just like just a nice equal footing for everybody mm -hmm. is really, really special. A comfort zone basically. Yeah. yeah.
Totally. Oh. And that, and that's our thing. I think by by removing the necessity to buy a ticket to this event, you get a whole new group of people that, you know, and it's great because a lot of people do come and donate to the event and, right. and make financial contributions and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's really cool to hear the stories where, you know, you have kids who are dealing with so much financial insecurity because of the pandemic. And like, if it wasn't for this event, they'd just be stuck stuck at home all the time because they can't afford the gas to go somewhere and then buy a ticket and then do this or do that. You know, so that's really, really cool. And then talking about the land thing, what, what I, what I really, really love is that we have, um, we have a group of like three or four guys who come to almost all of our events <laughs> and we always set aside a game station with Halo on it because <laughs> they will get they will, on there they, yeah. and they will play Halo like on, cause we always have Wi-Fi at all of our right, events. Yeah. So they'll just jump on Halo and start playing online and stuff and, and they'll be playing split screen. So it's like really cool to see stuff like that. And I'm sure if uh, you said, but is there an age limit to this? Like do you have it's, 18 and over? Or? It's 18 and over. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, our signature event is 18 and over. So the way CGN works, we produce three events a month, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes four and my team is going to kill me if I keep doing that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, our signature monthly event is Gamer Gathering. That's always at Tabaris in South End. It's the first Friday of every month. So everybody knows when it is, where it's at. And that's the event that gives free open bar, all you can drink, free food. Everything is free. Um, and we usually have drag entertainers. We have a live DJ um, who's really, 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 really amazing. Um, and it's just a big free party, you yeah. know, and people come and play video games and it's a whole lot of fun. And then outside of that, we do CGN After Dark, which is an event where we go to an LGBT affirming business and our, and our network, those who attend that have the expectation. They know that, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy this experience. You know, they bring money to purchase products at this business. Right. We usually do it at bars and restaurants and breweries. Our next one is at um, Heist Brewing for Veterans Day. Okay. And um, and there, like, we always work with the venue to give us, you know, something. Like, they're going to give us a free welcome drink for everybody. Mm -hmm. And then people buy their drinks as they go. Gotcha. Um, and then our next one is CGN Social, where we unplug everything. We don't play board games. We don't play video games. And we go, like, hike Crowder's Mountain, or we go to the White Water Center, or like we do stuff where we bring our gamers out into the world right. and just, you know, enjoy nature and, and stuff like that. <laughs> or just do like go to the movies or and, and things like that. Just like hang we, out. Just, just hang out. Just yeah. hang out. And then we have CGN Unplugged, which is our big board game. That's what's happening later today. Uh, nice. So mm -hmm. as you're the owner, um, mm -hmm. have you seen like relationships happen due to company with like your members? Yeah. So this is actually around? really interesting that you bring that up. Yeah. So. Um, you know, it's always a scary prospect in the gay community when you start things like this and bring people together. You're like, oh my God, like everybody's going to be fucking each other. And <laughs> you know, like, like it's, 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 Let's it's, go. A, right? <laughs> it's a, it's a worry, you know, like how are, how do you navigate that where, you know, somebody flirts with somebody and it's not, it's not reciprocated and that causes awkwardness or weirdness or whatever. And thankfully, we really haven't had all those many issues. We have had a lot of people who have found significant others through the organization. Um, you know, one of our officers um, met his partner through a CGN event. That's awesome. You know, so you do get some of that as well, which is really, really cool to see. And, and that just goes back to relationships, you know, growing. And even if it's not a romantic relationship, like all the friends yeah. that people have found, you know, there's... You know, we know of members who came to town within CGN's creation who had just moved here, didn't have any, didn't know anybody here. And now they're like partying like rock stars every weekend with, you know, friends from the group and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm going to take my little sister here. So she's new to the Charlotte area. Mm -hmm. So I want to. She's like video games too, so it's like the perfect place for her. To and that's, that's the awesome. thing too. It's yeah. it's a really great community for women as well. We have a lot of women who come to our events, straight and gay. It's it's a really, really just awesome group of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, man. So let me ask you this. Just like you mentioned, like that that first gaming moment mm -hmm. that hit us. Mm -hmm. Mine was Zelda Ocarina of Time. Legend of Zelda Ocarina Mine of was Time. Too. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. My brother had it for Nintendo 64, and I remember spending five hours in Kikiri Town. <laughs> just why, I didn't know how to get out because we had that little dickhead at the front. Uh, it took me six years to get so out. So mine was, I really liked Ocarina of Time. And by the way, like that, the theme song of Kokiri Village to this day is dun, dun, like dun, 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 dun. so stuck in my head, yeah, man. Same. Like, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll notice it at some of our events. We'll do DJ mixes of yeah. video game music. Oh, cool. yeah. And so Kokiri uh, Forest is always on. Always on. <laughs> on that list um but mine was actually a link to the past on super nintendo oh, nice. yeah, yeah. Game. yeah super good game and my thing again like what i was mentioning earlier like you have that moment like you remember like what it was like 
playing those games at the first time. And so I, I was raised by my grandmother. So my grandmother would always sit right next to me and she would like, she loved Legend of Zelda. So my grandmother awesome. would sit there and just like watch me play and like, just like, oh, what the, like what's going on? Like, what's the story? <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. You know, so we played The Link to the Past and then when Ocarina of Time came out, oh my God, she was obsessed, you know, with the 3D models and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. So those are kind of my, that's what's tied in, in my head, you know, thankfully my grandmother's still alive so we can reminisce and talk about things yeah. like this. Um, that's so sweet. Yeah, you know, and that's what, you know, that's what I say when, you know, that's where my passion comes from is mm -hmm. that if I had that experience, I know that there's so many other people in our community who come to a CGN event and they meet all these people and they're like, oh my God, there's other people like me in this community. And that's their gaming experience. Creates a memory for that's, them. Yeah, that's where they get tied. And they're like, that was their, that's their most memorable gaming experience. Now, I'm sure you, know? you guys have made it, created like a good home for like, and to nurture like growth and stuff like that mm -hmm. for these people. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I, I, I hate to bring this up on a sad note, but even like, you know, especially within people in our community, you know, especially the younger kids, yeah. you know, 18, 19, 20 years old who come to our events, you know, you really, I'm, I'm about to turn 30. So even with me, it's like, it's hard to see, like, you know, I thought I had it rough growing up, but with everything going on with, you know, society and, and all of these kids, you know, they're going through mental health issues mm -hmm. that I couldn't have even imagined, you know, yeah. when, when I'm sure when all of us were growing up, um, you know, and some of these kids would come up to me and be like, you know, thank God that you're doing this, like, you know, because I was having these, you know, suicidal ideations or whatever it may have been, you know, I was very depressed today and this kind of just brought me back. You know, and, you know, there's a few kids like that in our group where, you know, I look at them now and just seeing their own personal growth and how they've grown and now how I remember very well that they would come to their first event and they would sit in the corner and wouldn't talk to anybody because they were so socially anxious to open yeah. up and to meet people and all of that. And now they're the ones running the groups and, yeah. and getting games together and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the best part right yeah. there, man. Yeah. Just creating relationships and See, stuff. Mm -hmm. this is why I love fucking video games because no matter what bullshit's going on in your life when you flip on that switch and you see your character come on screen mm -hmm. you're no longer in this bullshitty life anymore you're virtually, escapism yeah mm -hmm. you escape right into the game you can feel at home and like it's just magical mm -hmm. and that's why like these events are awesome cuz you can meet someone there that has the exact same interest in you and they can be a complete stranger mm -hmm. it's 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 that's sorry, I, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional. <laughs> I, 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 that's why I want to take my sister yeah. there too, because she's she's like me, growing up really shy at the time, mm -hmm. and I want her to. She loves Overwatch and yeah. loves the hell out of players that every damn day, and I like I want her to see other people who's. Clear. I know there's people that dislike her as well, and she mm -hmm. want her to create a relationship from there. Yeah, and please bring her. Place. Please bring yeah. her because you know that's that's our big thing. You know, you mentioned Keelan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, shout out to Keelan, dude. Keelan is the yeah. best. I love that boy. <laughs> um, you know, we're. Um, there are certain members in our organization. Some are leaders, some aren't. Keelan is a perfect example of this. You know, mm -hmm. Keelan is like a brand ambassador for CGN. There is a group of people who, when people come to our events and, you know, we notice that, hey, nobody's interacting with that person, those brand ambassadors will go in and bring that person in and be like, hey, let's go play a game. Hey, can I get you a drink? Like, how are you doing today? Like, stuff like that, you yeah. know, and, and, and we bring those people in, um, you know, because that's, you know, very important to be able to 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 really infuse our organization with these newer folks and and continue building that that family branding. Yeah. To to bring everyone closer together. Yeah, I mean that's really important. And even when I like when I was there, because I the first hour I was there was kind of like by myself, just hanging out. But mm -hmm. I sat down and yeah. yeah, it was just because like I don't know who to talk to right now. But I sat down and played Mortal Kombat, and some dude named Bill just started <laughs> Doctor Freeman chatting me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, oh, great. And then after that, it was like such an easy experience. So you yeah. just talked to where it was there. Mm -hmm. It's pretty great. I love I love the sense of community that you guys have fostered. I love, it may seem silly to some outsiders to like spend all these thousands of dollars into getting all this gear. Mm -hmm. But I think that you guys are truly doing a, like a really great service to a community that a lot of the times is not thought about mm -hmm. when it comes to like being the focus of attention and like having it there. So like. I just, I really appreciate it, man. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're about to wrap it up. It's almost been an hour and you okay. got to go to that event. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the spiel? How can we help you? Where can we find you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if people are interested in checking out CGN or donating to CGN, where mm -hmm. can we do all that? So you can find us at www.charlottegamersnetwork.com. 
Um, all of our stuff is on there, all of our social media profiles. Please support us on Patreon. You can search us uh, through that way as well. Um, CGM Plus members at the $10 a month level um, receive VIP registration to all of our events. We also do an exclusive once a month member event just for our donors, which is um, usually a house party or like a social, something like that. Um, and yeah, we do three events a month. Um, come find us. We'd love to see you. Nice. Awesome. Or can I find the suggestion box to put that Tetris game in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's random, but do you guys do like uh, recommendations about anything, about games or anything? Or is it all on you guys? We do. We do, actually. So we have a newsletter that goes out once a month where we do board game reviews um, and we do reviews on stores and video games coming out and stuff Ooh. like that as well. Yeah. Well, other than that, what have you boys been up to? Uh, on some relaxing, ooey gooey type. Shit. Playing Battlefield 2042. How's Battlefield? Do you, do you notice how I ignore the ooey gooey type? <laughs> it's a, <laughs> you no, it's, slipped it in there? <laughs> I, it's, it's a great game. Yeah. But that beta is awful. Good lord. The beta was kind of rough. Did you play on PS5 or that PC? That beta is awful. No, it is. It's yeah. like Good lord. fucking unplayable at times. Like it's I, all, I mean, it's like other it's white than, flashes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my biggest issue. It's yeah. like there's random on the PS5, there's this like. White flashes that Ragged happen. Ragdoll figures, like tanks are lit. I literally Joe Joker saw someone go underground last night. <laughs> I've never seen it before. Ain't that's that shit you see on YouTube? That's, yeah, saw that happen. What a tank go underground? Go uh, like that's pretty, but no, that's standard. That's standard issue for see, Battlefield. I know, games. No, I never clipping, clipping issues always been a big thing with Battlefield games. They've it's all. Bad. That's how you always know that they're PC games because there's there's always major clipping issues. I know a PC experience because the way the control is laid out. This is clearly a keyboard game. And it's so much options, and the controller can do so much. Did you do you know how to? I it took me two days to figure out how to switch over my guns. What do you mean? How to change it? How to change gun. it? That L1. took me like three games. I was like, <laughs> I was like, how the where, fuck? You got to do it at the beginning. Like you had to yeah. hit the bumpers to get yeah. over it. I gotta say, the one thing that I hate about Battlefield, the thing that I hate the most is the UI for the menus. It is garbage. I was gonna mention that I'm sick of modern games, and I get it. Yeah. But the texts are so fucking small. Yeah. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. oh it's to like to Take like zip point. line or to like interview. Like, what does that say? It, it, yeah, it's super <laughs> tiny. That it's might be a tiny. that might be a glitch or something. That that it's because it, it would normally wouldn't be that small. Yeah, and I don't like it's probably the beta thing when you kill an enemy. I don't like that little text they have now. It's I, like, I prefer, oh, it's smaller. I prefer like fours or something, or like like, the, like just the number. No, like you kill someone. A Call of Duty has something to yeah. pop up. Battlefield uh, twenty four two is so small to me. It's yeah. boring to look at. And all that that might, you might be able yeah. to fix that in that because you're gaming in a four K TV, aren't you? Yeah. That you might be able to fix that. You might, there might be a scaling button. Scaling button. Because um, in PC, it's not that big of a problem. I'm playing. I'm oh, playing, that makes more sense then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm playing in 1080 monitor, and it's not that not that big of an issue. Mm-hmm. Also, like the graphical issues are not that big of a problem in the PC version. Mm-hmm. It, it really like I I only clipped through the ground like once. I, yeah. But yeah, but other than that, like the game is no, it's a great game. The game's yeah. good. Yeah. Like the game's the game, really solid. Yeah. The graphics on it, fantastic. fantastic. Like really, really good. Yeah, especially when it's raining and you, oh, like yeah. the small detail, like your uh, med kit or support kit has like rain drops coming on and on it. And then your and then gun has like uh, water droplets, and then even like when the water when a r- raindrop hits it, it soaks in and makes it a little bit darker. That's really nice. And I think I think the recoil is a little too high yeah. in this game. Uh, but it's standard battlefield, more technical than ever. It like, really does everything feel fucking incredibly matters. technical, yeah. Yeah, like the, the I love the, my favorite thing in the game is the fucking option to change your gun mid game. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that yeah, shit's that, fucking cool. Because yeah. I'm I'm a person that's like I would I've been begging for something like that because yeah. I'm definitely technical like that where yeah. where if I because the battlefield is a random game where you can be really close quarters and very long quarters away from somebody and be able to, to like switch between a four time scope and a uh, red dot. Oh, is, so a, good. is so such a game awesome. changer for me. Yeah, like That's Jordan, do the shit for me. And go close it. I can't wait for shit like that. Yeah, yeah. Like. we should. Oh, we should. Uh, wait. Can you? Can you? It's cross cross play. It's cross play. I saw PC players. No, no play. not yet. Not the beta's not. The beta. Yeah, it was cross play. But it, it was cross play. Yeah. I played cross play. But, well, uh, okay. Well, it is. It's cross play, but you can't link up with your friends yet. Not yet. Anyway, not yet. I, I don't the, understand. The social how feature is still not available. Right. That's how I was confused. Was it not? But I don't know if that's. But what always happens with betas like that? Like the the social features get added in later because. That has to do a lot of integration with the PS network and yeah. PC and Steam and all of that. Sorry, what were you saying, Carmen? I, I so well, I so there's no social features, so I don't know if me. I knew you couldn't do crossplay with your friends, mm-hmm. but I don't know because me and Tay are both on PS5. 
I don't know if we could like link up somehow. I guess yeah. not. Once a, once a game comes out, we'll be able to. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. I didn't know how to do it because it was so weirdly. Yeah. Yeah, because the menu fucking sucks. The menu kind of sucks. Right, sure. Right. Just put a list, mate. Yeah. Let's have a lot of this bumper it, bullshit. Yeah. yeah. That's what I said. It's clearly, again, it's just a bad full thing. They're, they're PC games at first. Yeah, that's true. Then console second. Um, um, that being yeah. said, it, it's a really good game. Yeah, I played I, the Halo I, Infinite beta too. That was up. Um, People are praising the hell out of it. It's fine. That's fucking fine. No, uh, that's not good. <laughs> it, it's people say it's just like it's just Halo. It's a Halo game. Yeah, I heard. I've seen a lot of people comparing it to like it's like Call of Duty. That's the bit. thing. Well, the, the thing that made Halo really interesting was kind of like the Quake like charm that the arena you put into it. type. Just the the radar, the game, the <laughs> get out of here. Just the 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 movement, like the very specific like bounciness that it has, and like. When you call it dudeify it, it just kind of loses. Call a lot it dudeify. But that's what I like about. I'm in my I'm my order. I love four. Four for like a more stream on Halo game, which I prefer. And four is I really yeah. like four too. Like I, I think the it, gameplay in four is really solid. But there's something missing from Halo Infinite that they haven't quite hit you figured there. out yet. And I think like once they do, because it's gonna be a life service game. Once they do, I'm sure like it's gonna be like I give it like six months. Before oh, this it gets is back. fucking free, isn't it? Yeah, Halo Infinite is free. It's going to be Wait, like Warzone. It is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The multiplayer is going to be like Warzone. You pay for the campaign. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, now I can't remember now. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that part, I'm really, I'm, I really want to see the game like a year after it releases because I feel like More that's where it's going to be like where it needs to be. But right now, it's fucking fine. <laughs> and the thing that annoys me the most is the grappling hook. It's just not as good as I thought it would Damn, be. Damn, I really, I was kind of, yeah. I was like, when I, when I saw a grappling hook, I'm like, that's what Halo needed, grappling yeah. hook. But, grappling, but no, it's, it's that's a bummer. Like, it's like it's like an equipment, and then you fucking can, like, Battlefield has that now. Yeah, ba- Battlefield it works actually <laughs> really well. Like, fucking Spider-Man. Battlefield is what what you <laughs> Battlefield yeah. needed that grappling hook. Yeah. I've been I was, like when you can kind of integrate the the grappling hook a little bit better, it, you're like, oh, oh shit, shit, this is a game yeah. changer right here. I got I got I was really frustrated with Battlefield until I started getting kills. <laughs> once, I, once I started getting kills, I was just like, all right, I got this game. Yeah, I used to yeah. be like the Call of Duty guy, but when I shipped it, it was Back Company 2 is my first Battlefield experience. Mm-hmm. It's fucking, this is my go-to multiplayer Battlefield. Yeah. Back right? Company 2 is still my fucking favorite online multiplayer tier, experience. No one has beat the yet, yet, and I still stand by that. That game is fucking awesome. Yeah. They need important. to be master that or something. They do. They do. It's going to print money. Well, I mean, in the new Battlefield, there's going to be like stuff from... Oh, that's, that's right. That's, that's just going to be maps. wild where they... Oh, yeah. Because they're going to do... They're integrating all of the battlefields into this game. Yeah, like all their Forgot like characters that. are going to be in it. Uh, vehicles are going to be in it. That's I think awesome. it's Portal or whatever it's called. Yeah, they bring like you should like fight like a World War Two gun. And I can't wait to see the yeah. custom match for that, where yeah. it's like. I forgot it's about 1942 that. versus 1948. Oh, that's gonna be sick. Or not uh, 19 uh, or 2042. 2042. Yeah. yeah. It's gonna yeah. be sick. No, I'm really excited. Uh, that. That's pretty yeah. much all I did, and then I watched the new James Bond movie. Oh, I finished Squid Game too. Yeah, eating him double oh seven, double oh seven, isn't it? I think I'm so sick of those ads. I probably said that last week. Yeah, you did. They find like an end. Tell you again, I haven't even got an ad. Dude, I it's think. awful. They're, they're directly. Dude, they this, want you to go see. Yeah, they're like, watch <laughs> this now. I even saw a Spanish one last night. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I finished Squid Game. Uh, How was that? Two nights ago. I Squid- couldn't get into it. Really? Yeah, I watched the first episode and you I was like so interested. You can suck my dick, fuck dude. Just ass. conform. <laughs> yeah, no, conform. No, <laughs> nah, Squid Game's fucking awesome. I, yeah. I love the hell out of it. Uh, episode six destroyed me. Damn, Jesus Christ! But the ending when they did that, don't like that. <laughs> uh, I don't know the one to spell, but the red hair was a fucking yeah, weird. I hated that. That was a weird choice. Uh, was he? Because he did it as a joke. That's a surprise. He was no, I about. think it's like an anime thing. What do you mean? I think he's like he's a new, yeah, like a new beginning. But the the shade of red was. He looks like, dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, episode six was fantastic, but God, the leaves. They were playing the marble The shit. marble game, yeah, Good that Lord. was like a. But they kind of threw it away, though. They like, were playing the marble game? It's it, kitty games. Playing Marvel versus Capcom. It, it was like yeah. where, like, the. Where, like. Everyone's intentions kind of got, like, had to be shown, pretty oh, much. I got you, got you. It was, it's a, it's a. Pretty like it's a gut wrenching episode. Damn. Yeah, well, that does make me want to rewatch it. I watched the first episode and I was like, I don't care about this gambling dad. Yeah, she's this guy. Yeah, she's not a bad character. No, uh, it, it the show tells you he's nah, a he's a piece guy. of shit. Nah, he's a piece no, of shit. He, he <laughs> nah, he for sure. That's what the show tells you. Like he generally is. A, I saw a tweet that was like a perfect tweet for the show. It's like this dude is er- anything but a good father. Or like he tries his he this man is doing everything but be a good father. Like what's his name? Uh. Uh, 
So I he's, he's the most realistic character in the show. The doctor guy? Yeah. They got the glasses. Uh, he was in, um, his mom owns a shop. Yeah, the doc. Yeah, yeah or uh, business major, or whatever. UNC, where he go to some shit. USC or whatever. Uh, damn, I knew the decline from him from the get go. Oh yeah, yeah I mean yeah. yeah. Or the old man. Okay. You know my favorite moments in the podcast is when you guys get into a conversation and I just get to look at the camera. <laughs> well, we gotta stop the simping from the Asian girl though. <laughs> People are going crazy over her. Yeah, no, it's crazy. People need yeah. to stop simping in general. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's kind of that's kind of what we've been up to. Just yeah, not a whole lot happened. Just playing Battlefield <laughs> Forty Two. <laughs> <Like her? laughs> that's one of my favorite videos of all time. Yeah, well, simply slay. Well, how long is this intro going to be? Yeah, like we're we're running a little bit long on. Yeah, I'm cutting it up. I'm cutting it up. Make sure because I don't chop, want chop, chop, the chop, guy chop. getting annoyed. Like where are we? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's going to be the juxtaposition between this yeah. and then yeah. that. Really, really like, so serious yeah, in the next part. I'll, prob- <laughs> I'll probably cut it by the time that we were. We were done talking right. about Battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good stopping yeah. point. I'll put this at the end of the episode uh, just for a bonus. Yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, it'll be sick. Anyway, uh, 